everybody it's soren baker here on unique access entertainment as always please hit that subscribe button it's right down there and it's free that enables us to keep coming to y'all as often as possible with as many interviews as possible so please hit that subscribe button like our content share it talk about it be about it each one teach one and we appreciate your support while you're there hit that join button if you haven't already that really helps the cause to a lot Definitely watch a video or two to keep us in your algorithm and make sure you're subscribed if you already think you are, because some people say they subscribe, then they're not. But today, man, we got the honor and privilege of being joined by a long time, man, been a long time fan of this man, friend of his, seen him many, many times over the years, hung out with him, spent a lot of time building. DJ Muggs, thank you for coming through, What's sir. Man? What's up, my brother? How you feeling? Man, it's always great to see you. And uh, Muggs has just put out his Soul Assassin's 3 Death Valley with the album and a movie. <clears throat> and I got to go to the uh, release for the movie out in L.A. So thanks for having me on that, Muggs. But um, I wanted to get, first of all, where can people see the movie? What's the rollout for that? So we're just doing screenings around the world right now. We did L.A., we did Chicago. We did New York last night. We'll be doing San Francisco next week. And then the movie's going to tour Europe with me. And But um, we're world premiering it on Amazon. Amazon, it'll be um, September 13th. So the whole world can see it. And you'll get a free digital download of the album with the movie. And there's going to be some hidden tracks in the movie that you have to QR code to go get a couple new tracks. So, you know, it's um, it's it's just using technology to push things forward and having fun and being creative with technology, with film. And, um, well, we always over here, man, trying to just stretch this, stretch what we do and stretch the culture. You know what I'm saying? Well, you, you keep doing it. So congratulations on that. Um, and with the film, I, I was surprised that you actually participated in the acting of it and you're featured throughout it. So what, you know, you, I mean, I know you and I've talked to you and, hung out many times but you usually are in the background so much what made you willing or want to kind of step forward a little bit more well this was it was my thing so i figured it might have been awkward for somebody else to be acting in this so and um so that's pretty much what it was man you know it wasn't you know we had a great time i think making this film was one of the you know one of the really good time i had it's like you know it might be cliche but the journey is the destination right so once it was done, I was like, shit, can we start another one just to go on the adventure? We went on to make this because we made it in Death Valley, California. We made it with Joshua Tree. We, we went to Oakland. We went to San Francisco. We was in Berkeley. We was in L.A. You know what I'm saying? So it was like all those trips and all those missions making this shit. And what was the significance and the symbolism of Death Valley for you, both for the film and for the album itself? Well, you know, it's a it's a mile below sea level, and it's still and it's still over your head. It's the hottest fucking place on earth, hottest place in North America, and uh, the lowest place in North America. But it um, you know, it's where all the bodies got buried. So it's where the mob buried everybody. You know what I mean? So it has a lot of significance, you know, and um, and plus the title was dope, and it worked out. You know. It was, yeah. Kind of, kind of we were just kind of building the plane as it was flying, you know what I mean? Just making shit up as we went along. Okay, cool. And one of my favorites on there is the Joker's Wild with CeeLo Green. And uh, obviously, for those that know, you did stuff with Goody Mob back in the day, so you have a long standing relationship with those guys. But right. the thing that really intrigued me about it was his flow and his accent and the story. So did he come in with that? Did you ask him to do it? Like, how did that happen? I ran into CeeLo. Um, it was funny. I ran into him in Mexico. He's like, what's up with the next Soul Assassin? I'm like, oh, it's coming soon. Went back to the crib, and I digitized a bunch of cassettes from the 90s. I had a whole big-ass bag of, like, 200 cassettes. So I digitized them, and I found a bunch of beats I did in the 90s. And that particular beat, I just threw up on Instagram story one night, just fucking around while I was in the studio. And he hit me immediately. He was like, yo, I need that beat. I shot it to him. And then um, I want to say about a month later, he sends me back the song. He's like, yo, check this shit out. I have an open mind, but I'm coming from the perspective of the Cholo. He's like, Muggs, I love L.A. I love West Coast culture. I love Cholo culture. I just love L.A. And like, you know, him having respect and stuff. So that was his POV. And what do you think was uh, different or distinctive about what he did uh, thematically and story wise? Oh, man, his story was on point. It was about a dude in the streets, you know, um, going to jail and then 
having some youngsters look at him when he gets out of jail, you know, and he getting goes the right way, even though he's um wants to be drawn back to the to the evil side of things, he's he stays positive, you know what I mean? And the struggle of trying to stay positive after living like this. But CeeLo's an artist, man. He just isn't a rapper that catches the cadence and flows with it. Like there's melodies in his raps and then like he sings and he sounds like an angel, man. It's very angelic when it gets to the hook. You know, and in his bridge leading up to it, man, you know, his accents are amazing. So I haven't heard him rap in a long time, man. And he rapped on the first Soul Assassin record, um, did a song called Decisions, Decisions, which is probably one of the greatest verses I've ever heard in hip hop history. No bullshit. You know what I'm saying? And when we did that first song, he wasn't really sure, man. He said, man, I don't know, because he's used to rapping on shit very musical, you know, and that's real stripped down, kind of loopish. But, you know, he got Rhyme of the Month in the source for that. Everybody loves that that verse. And, um, so we were just making that connection from that first record and this record, knowing how great that first one was. I thought it was an, an, a, a really important thing to have CeeLo again. And when he came like this, and that just triggered off a series of events where me and him probably like seven, eight songs deep into a project, joint project. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, that's amazing on many levels. So I'm excited to hear that when it's ready. And... The thing, too, is with CeeLo and some of the other guests we'll get to with Death Valley 3, they're very intricate. They're more the quote-unquote classic old-school style. But then you got, like, the Boldy James. And then one of my favorites that you got a lot on the album is TF. Um, Shell Casings is one of my favorite performances of his on Death Valley. But for as a producer, how do you look at, work with, or have to adjust when it's a unorthodox different type of flow and then CeeLo who could do basically anything well for me it was you know I got some I got some legends on there Scarface you know um one of his last verses he'll probably ever do you know um Method Man Slick Rick you know some of the classics and then I got some you know the, the new legends the new legends like the Freddie Gibbs and the Bodie James and the Rock Marcy and the West Side Guns right then I got some of the future that what's coming next, which would be the TFs and the Jay Worthies and the and the you know two eleven. So I try to put the sprinkle of all them and put them all together. And without this being a compilation record, I put people on there multiple times to make it a cohesive project. You know what I mean? So people will appear two times on the record, a few people. So I mean, and you know, I probably did another twenty five songs. The hardest part for me was like, what songs do I use? You know, I was like, it took me like a damn month to sequence this shit. Like, I kept moving songs in and out and changing shit around. And then I was like, I'm going to do a double album, at least a month apart. And um, I ended up settling with this, you know, I could have went a hundred ways. Well, speaking of that, you have in the last several years, especially uh, maybe even starting with the Grand Masters. Since then, you've been putting out so much material. Um and I know you have stuff in the vaults, you got stuff you're working on <clears throat> all the time. How and why has there been such a huge increase the last 15 years or so of output from you? It's easy, man. It's just easy, bro. It's <laughs> like motherfuckers don't realize how easy it is. Everybody putting music out, it's so easy. Pretty much samples are everywhere. You know what I mean? It's easy to get to, 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 to talk to your people. You just go on social media. Before I had a get on in a magazine you know try to go on a mix show someplace you know and get on the mix show and um you know hopefully they wrote about you in the magazine you know and sometimes legacy actually might get a little blurb here and there and then going through these fucking labels before you had to go through it you had to go through a label or you had to go to a big studio run it for 100 an hour get a get a recording engineer then you have to get a mix engineer and mix your shit then you had to go master it somewhere and then try to put it out. So what was you going to do? Press up your own vinyls and then there's no distribution. You're only local, right? And then what do you do? Go to Fat Beats and make, you know, a dollar a record. So I mean, that shit was exciting for me. Like, that's boring to me. I don't like the industry. I didn't like that business model. But the, I wasn't on Facebook. I wasn't on MySpace, you know. But when Instagram came around, evidence said, yo, check this new thing out. It's only for photos. And that's what it was at the beginning. I was like, oh, shit. So I just started posting photos. And I had an Instagram account before this, man. I had a couple hundred thousand people just posting. And I just erased someone that I just got, I, I, I did, I just cut all my social medias off one day. And then I was like, oh shit, I could use this as a storefront and start tapping into people. So then that's what made me just 
get hyped because I don't got to go through nobody. I don't need fucking nobody writing about my shit. I don't need a label. I can go direct to my people globally right now and just tap into everybody. There's 7 billion people. I was like, let me go tap into my people. And, um, you know, computers made shit very easy where I could be anywhere and be in the, have a studio now where I don't have to be carrying a drum around, drum machine trying to find a studio, you know, and book time. So just utilizing technology to, to push to push forward, you know what I mean? It just makes things very easy, which inspired me to just want to do more shit because I was like, oh, shit, here we go. Yeah. Well, it reminds me, too, as I was watching the movie for Death Valley, I remember one of our conversations back in the day, you were one of the first people that I remember saying that you would stop watching TV and you were almost only watching YouTube. Uh, and this was, again, 15 years ago, maybe more. Um, do you remember what it was about the YouTube that appealed to you so much back then? Yes. Like before I would wait for my show to come on on a Tuesday or I'd have to wait, you know, to see what I wanted to see when it came out. Right. Whenever they programmed it on television or you might have to go buy, rent a fucking VHS, you know, but now I could go watch what I wanted to when I wanted to, you know, and I was always into national geographic shit like that. You know what I'm saying? So me being able to go find things like that and then find knowledge and books on tape and different historical things that I'm interested in. I was like, that's what I want to watch. You know what I mean? So YouTube was YouTube. Like I had that, my, my fingertips and my call just 24 seven, just boom. You know, it just made it, it made it very interesting to, to, to dive into that. And, you know. and then how did you, how did you then decide to blend some of that stuff into the film, the Death Valley film? What do you mean? Because I know you guys had talked about using some clips and there's like reporting footage. So it's kind of like a. So that, that, that That's all Jason Goldwatch. So Goldwatch approached me like this album was done, man. And I wasn't sure I was going to put it out because I'm bored of music videos, man. I've done hundreds of them. And, you know, I just watch everybody smoking a spliff in front of the car being cool, you know, acting like they balling out of control with their fucking shoes, their fucking Nikes on. It's just boring, bro. Y'all ain't doing nothing. I mean, I know it's about making content, but okay, now let's let's push this content to another space, right? So I was like, how am I going to put this out? What's going to be the extra thing for this thing? So I hit Go Watch Up, and I was like, come through. Can you help me create something that's 20 minutes long, something that I could, you know, push out with this with this movie? And he was like, man, that's a, that's a big, big ass. So I gave him the album and said, pick the songs you want. And um, we ended up making a 34-minute film. And the way Goldwatch works is he used, he, he drew a lot from different stock stuff that he found on YouTube. So, for instance, there's a scene at the beginning where you're seeing a dude running from the police. That's a real dude running from the police. You know, so what I did is I dressed like the dude, cut my hair like the dude, and I had to run like the dude. So now when you look at it, and if you don't know, you know, it looks like it's me running from the police. And just he incorporated a lot of things. Like we incorporated, um, he wanted to, he wanted to use um, some Goodfellas VO. And I was like, no, man, that just sounds like mixtapes from the early 2000s, all that Scarface shit, all that, all that Goodfellas shit. So I was like, but if we wrote original VO, we can do that. And then he was like, and then we start, so we wrote original shit and then we used, um, um, AI, and we used Ray Liotta's AI voice, right, to get so the vibe how, we want. So, how do you balance remaining classic, doing the standard, typical classic mug sound, but incorporating and using, advancing, and tweaking technology to your benefit? I just use it, and it just comes out through my filter, and it comes out the way I want. So, you know, it's I'm always doing my shit, and it's just you know just pushing things to the future and stay inventive, man, and stay challenging yourself and, and stay experimenting and take a chance. It's like, I ain't a beat maker. I'm an inventor. You know what I mean? I, I invent. It's like, I bring styles. We was the first ones to bring this weed shit. Everybody was smoking weed, but nobody was talking about it. It wasn't smoking weed because it gave a brother brain damage. You know what I mean? And brain damage on the mic doesn't manage. But we came in and globally made this weed shit cool. You know what I'm saying? And we're always we're bringing in bringing our own sound. Like if this this is the hot shit, everybody's doing this hot soul beast this week. I ain't doing that shit. If everybody's this is the new sound, I ain't doing that shit. We always doing our shit, man, and just always trying to stretch ourselves and stretch what we do. And and, and with with that is you know stretch this this style of music we like. Just stretching 
the culture of it. As you know, a few years back, we was like, yo, what happened to the shit we like? That shit had dipped. If you look at the stock market, there's a big dip. It took a dip, and you wasn't really sure where they was calling it. Where's this real shit? Like, where was it? You know, and it was a strange time because once the music business took a shift and everything went digital after Napster, there was like every nobody was selling records. Remember it, but there was no Apple Music yet, and there was right. no Spotify yet. And YouTube was barely starting, and it was kind of like, where did we go from? There was no digital distribution, you know, and so it was a strange time. So now it's like, this is the kind of music I love. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to inspire the youth and the next generation. So when they want to make music, they're going to be like, this is the kind of shit I want to do. You know what I mean? And 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 I, it, this has given me so much, man, and opened so many doors for me. And I was inspired by, like, you know, the Molly Malls, the Rick Rubens, the Larry Smith, the Sed G's, the Bomb Squad, like, APMD. Like, these are the motherfuckers. This is the reason I do this shit. So, I'm, you know, I'm here. And, and my motivations ain't money. My motivations ain't fame. So my motivation is just to be creative and set the tone for the future. Be sure to check out the History of Gangster Rap by Soren Baker. He's official. History of Gangster Rap features exclusive interviews with Ice-T, Snoop Dogg, MC Ren, the DOC, and dozens of others. The History of Gangster Rap, a definitive look at how Los Angeles changed rap forever. In Los Angeles, the streets definitely set the tone of the hip hop music. A 19, I got a $50,000 car. My whole angle always was, I'll be street, but I will always tell you the horrors that go along with this life. It will be penalties and casualties for just wearing the wrong color in somebody's neighborhood. And once gangster rap made it from the streets to the TV, the genre exploded. What's that, five on your TV basketball? Your MTV it just catapulted us from being local heroes to national gangbang rappers. The history of gangster rap discusses it all from 1980 up till today. There's always gonna be shit happening in the streets. You know what I mean? So it's always going to be something to talk about. The history of gangster rap in stores now.